Everyone, welcome back. I'm going to introduce myself. So I'm Charu Bavare, one of the vascular attendings at Methodist. And okay, my topic is open and endovascular management of visceral occlusive disease. We chose this for the post-lunch session specifically. So my outline will be, we'll talk about etiology, some indications for treatment, endovascular, and then open revascularization, uh, chronic, and then acute mesenteric ischemia, and one word about median arcuate ligament syndrome and then some comparative da data between open and endo, and then some conclusions. Uh, causes are obviously numerous. They could be, the, obviously the most common cause is atherosclerosis. More, we see more commonly is, you know, atherosclerosis, embol embol embolic disease, dissection. This, the median arcuate ligament is not number four, it usually is number 52 actually on the diagnosis. FMD, neurofibromatosis, um, all the, the vasculitis, SLE, polyarthritis nodosa, uh, drugs can cause that, cocaine, uh, ergot poisoning. I don't know if anyone has even seen ergot poisoning anymore. I don't think we don't see it anymore. Uh, then non-occlusive is one you see in the ICUs, but we don't treat much, at least uh, not anymore. Uh, chronic mesenteric ischemia is rare, but the atherosclerotic stenosis in visceral vessels is not. By that I mean symptomatic chronic mesenteric ischemia is not very common, but you see atherosclerosis everywhere. And you have calcium here, calcium there, calcium everywhere. Uh, six to 10% autopsy specimens show about 50% or greater stenosis of at least one of three main visceral trunks. Fascinating part is because of the collateral flow, we are not symptomatic as much. 27% uh, patients undergoing angiogram for PVD were found to have asymptomatic stenosis as well. Uh, commonly, it's usually an orificial lesion, not actually way past in the vessel. You could get that, but mainly it's usually an orificial lesion from an aortic spillover. This is this huge inferior mesenteric artery collateral supplying from the IMA going upwards actually on a real-time angio. So, I mean, this patient obviously was symptomatic for something, but this was a finding. Uh, Diagnos diagnosis is not very easy, but uh, usually the clinical exam says, you know, food fear, loss of weight, no other reasons for loss of weight. Ultrasound is really limited by body habitus, but, you know, body habitus in these patients is not obese. They are not obese. So you can actually see it sometimes. Or diagnostic criteria would be uh, of a peak systolic velocity above 200 or more in the celiac and 250 or more in the SMA. Can can is strongly li linked to a severe stenosis. Uh, CT angio actually is the easiest, uh, everyone gets a CT angio nowadays. And then it's the easiest to delineate anatomy as well as aortic calcification can also tell you something about the bowel. The bowel is thickened or, you know, uh, in acute cases of the bowel is really necrotic as well. Uh, MRA avoids radiation, but you're unable to see calcification. So you don't know whether the stenosis is, at, is plaque, soft plaque, or is it hard plaque? You may not know that. The arteriogram is the gold standard, where you see real-time imaging with flow patterns from collaterals into main vessels, et cetera. And it could, it obviously, di the advantage is it's diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Uh, in the uh, recommendations are all patients with symptomatic chro chronic mesenteric ischemia should have revascularization, because acute on chronic mesenteric ischemia is really bad, bad for health, and bad for your call schedule, too. The goals are to reduce pain, prevent in infarction, regain the um, weight and nutrition. Uh, there is really no role for prophylactic revascularization unless you're, you know, like if you're asymptomatic, usually there's no role for pro prophylactic revascularization. But uh, if you have three vessel disease, then consider it, have a talk to, with the patient, consider doing something, because they, acutely they will get really bad, really worse. Uh, how many vessels to treat, endo versus open, is obviously a debate. There's no, there no definitive consensus. The initial history of endovascular revascularization was in the 80s, where the simple, it's called plain old balloon angioplasty, the POBA. It's not nothing, there's no special balloon, it's just a balloon. And then primary stenting with balloon expandable stent was with a bare metal stent. Uh, balloon expandable stents are good because of the precision and superior radial force compared to self-expanding stents. And you want these stents to be perfectly lined up, and not jump forward or come back when you're starting to deploy them. Uh, balloon expandable covered stents have now come into the market, which are uh, you know, a nice tool to have in your toolbox. Uh, usually access is percutaneous, either anti-grade through the brachial artery or retrograde through, the, through femoral axis. It all depends on the angle of the vessel. Usually brachial axis for the SMA is easier. 
the endovascular approach for mesenteric ischemia is now, if you see the, the, the solid black line is the open mesenteric revascularization, is now on a downward trend from the 90s to now, and endovascular revascularization is on the upward trend. It's the sign of our times. <clears throat> and of course, the availability and early, probably early diagnosis of this disease than a late diagnosis uh, as was in the past. The techniques are, you know, you shoot an aortogram, either anagrade or retrograde, uh, selective angiogram to see what the flow patterns are, if you can get across um, angles. Uh, like I said, the SMA is easier with the brachial axis, and the celiac is usually a right angle coming off, so even a femoral axis is possible. Usually if we put a guide catheter or a multipurpose sheath up at the orifice and then shoot another angiogram, uh, Recanalizing or going through the vessel, it's the wire of your choice, but uh, you know, 018, 014 wires uh, help you more. 035 wires may not cross, you might dissect something out there. Um, pre dilation depends on how much calcium you have, and then uh, the balloon expandable stent deployment, typically between 5 and 7 millimeters is what the SMA is. And uh, if you really have a nice nub of the SMA just at the origin, it's a nice place to gauge your landing zone in the aorta, because uh, if you don't, then you should land inside the aorta for sure, more than you would for just, just for the SMA stenting. Um, you have obviously have to do a completion arteriogram, make sure you don't lose wire access before that, by the way. You can, you can dissect onward and then you may have to re-stent across. Uh, the endpoints are you should have less than 10 to 30% residual stenosis, I say that because your calcium may be a bulky plaque which can still cause a stenosis, although you should have about 10 to 30 percent max. And then if you can measure pressure gradient, that will give you a good idea whether your, your angioplasty or stenting was successful. Uh, usually a dual antiplatelet therapy is standard for these patients post-op. Uh, pre and post-stent, uh, sometimes you know you see this, uh, they're seeing the acute angle from brachial axis and the, uh, this is actually the celiac, not the SMA but sometimes the angle goes this way, so it's easier from brachial axis. And then you have a multipurpose guide cath going into the celiac, which is just, I don't know why the slide was there. Um, the endovascular axis or for chronic mesenteric ischemia is actually is favorable for short segment stenosis, not for long. And if you have, mini, if you have moderate to minimal amount of calcification or thrombus, uh, if you have a little stump and you have a chronic uh, total occlusion or complete total occlusion beyond that, it's um, easy to engage it. The unfavorable part, part is if you have severe calcification, it's going to be hard to engage the artery. Uh, occlusions sometimes may be hard to cross, especially if you don't see distal filling anywhere, then you don't know what your, what your target is. Uh, long lesions are not very favorable for endovascular um, revascularization because of uh, failure. And then small vessel diameters are also bad. Uh, with endovascular, with, with any endovascular procedure, there are slightly higher rates of distal embolization, restenosis, and re-interventions. Um, well, there was uh, comparing bare metal stents. Typically, the patency is not bad for the first year, and then it goes down afterward, so which is expected. Uh, the group in Cleveland Clinic came up with their uh, outcomes of bare metal stents and or, uh, in percutaneous interventions. They were about uh, 65 patients, 87 vessels. Um, there was you know, clearly the SMA being the predominant one, the axis was brachial. They had about 80 balloon expandable stents, seven self expanding stents. I'm presuming the self expanding were beyond the initial balloon expandable one. And the, they had duplex ultrasound at one, three, and six months. Primary patency was low, but then the assisted primary patency was good, so clear, you know, clearly follow up and re interventions are required. Uh, the, there was no difference in patency between occluded and stenotic vessels, especially if you choose them well, short segment stenosis or occlusions will do well. Uh, there was no impact on vessel treated, number of vessels treated, or stent type. Uh, femoral axis was associated with reduced patency because of the angle that they could intervene on, and the stent was not in the aorta, though the stent was um, more so in the SMA. Uh, there was no impact on procedural factors on survival, and patient, uh, this is sadly no patient needing bowel resection survived because uh, those people actually re, with re-stenosis and bowel ischemia, they really go hard down pretty quickly. Uh, the group from 
Rochester, Minnesota. They came up with their instant restenosis uh, patients. So there are about 157 patients develop instant stenosis. Uh, about 19% uh, required treatment. All, everyone was with endovascular approach, and uh, they had about uh, 42 patients had a second episode of instant stenosis. So clearly, once it starts failing, it's going to keep on failing. So about, about half your patients will require something. Uh, covered stents actually has been the new topic, the balloon, especially the balloon expandable covered stents. Uh, the covered stent patency was shown to be about 86 percent. It's a small group, 108 patients, but uh, these are always small groups. You don't, this is not very common, but still the covered stent patency was uh, pretty superior. Uh, other options, now if you have a flush occlusion of both celiac and SMA, then what do you do? And you have a reconstitution of the SMA here. Anyone? Hands up for endovascular? No? Yeah, I would say no too. <laughs> I'm glad no one raised their hand. I would have caught you outside. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so chronic mesenteral arterial occlusive disease, the open <laughs> procedure. This is, the, this is the, the sexy procedure for mesenteric ischemia. So embolectomy for acute mesenteric ischemia, always remember if you suspect or if you know atherosclerotic disease, your incision on the SMA should be a vertical one, typically. The book says vertical for everything, but if you have a big juicy SMA and an embolus, an acute embolus with a normal vessel, you can get away sometimes with a transverse arteriotomy. The mesenteric bypasses could be anti-grade and retrograde based from the aorta or from the iliacs. Um, you can do a trans-aortic splanchnic end arterectomy. I have seen a video, but I've yet to see it in real life. And then the median arcuate ligament syndrome is the red herring, which, you know, it's diagnosis by exclusion. Uh, typically, the anti-grade bypasses go to aortoceliac and then aorto-SMA bypass. It's uh, usually a transabdominal approach, supraceliac control. Uh, usually, a good piece of the a good portion of the aorta which is not diseased. You can you can usually get away by doing a side biting clamp. You don't have to cross clamp the aorta completely. And the, it's a bifurcated graft. The textbook says, and it's a good thing to remember is, usually when we have bifurcated grafts, we keep them this way. But in this case, you want them slightly anterior posterior, not really on the side to side. So the, uh, the anterior one goes to the celiac and the posterior one can go behind the pancreas to the SMA. So Tam, how, how many retropancreatic tunnels do you do? Or do you do anti-pancreatic? You know, this is not a very common procedure. I've done them anterior to the pancreas. Yeah. So it's, I, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a finicky tunnel to do behind the pancreas. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, I... Mm -hmm. That's what. That's what. But in real, in real world, you may, you know, it's not, it's not prohibitively wrong to go in front of the pancreas, because uh, behind the pancreas you have the superior mesenteric vein going in there, and you have the splenic vein coming from above. They both join, become the portal vein at near behind the head, and uh, puncturing the portal vein is not good. <laughs> if nothing out of this talk, just remember that, it's a not, it's not a good thing. Uh, so aortoceliac and SMA, the, the key is to dissect down to good artery. Uh, sometimes you, um, when, you do, when you're doing this, you, do have, you can get down to the origin of the SMA. Uh, when you're doing a uh, approach through the, behind the transverse mesocolon, you don't really get to the origin. You come beyond that. So things to remember. Uh, retrograde bypasses are from usually from the iliac arteries. Of course, you have to make sure that the iliac is not diseased. Otherwise, it's a setup for failure. The SMA is taken is exposed by taking down the ligament of trites at the fourth portion of the duodenum, and then it's, it's in the. I have never done an end to end. I've always done an end to side because you don't want to knock off any more collaterals proximally. So any any retrograde flow you can give to any of the jejunal branches, you should preserve, um, and then. I'll, that, uh, that avoids cross clamping in uh, not so healthy individuals. And then uh, it also avoids, sometimes you can have an unclampable supraceliac aorta. You don't have, then you don't have to worry about that. It's, uh, you, could you could use Dacron or PTFE. It's a gentle C loop that, uh, that you have to make because once you've tented up the mesentery this way and you, when you put it down, it can kink it. So always keep some room. Uh, the, this is like just an academic thing about coral reef syndrome where it's like a chaka block calcium in the beginning of the vessel, but the rest of the aorta is okay, so you can consider bypasses in those people. Uh, the medial visceral rotation gives access to the entire aorta where you, do, where you want to do a splanchnic um, aortic end, end arterectomy. Be careful, the spleen is a very tenuous organ. 
injuring that is also not good for you or the patient, and then you might end up doing splenectomy. Uh, the transaortic endotrectomy are for people who failed endovascular or they have abdominal contamination or, pre or like pre previous abdominal operations, so you don't want to go transperitoneal, you go retroperitoneal. You can do a midline abdominal or a transverse abdominal or even a thoraco abdominal incision. Uh, you have to have some experience in doing a medial vessel rotation, so don't make that your first case. So, and obviously have somebody who has experience with, uh, with this procedure. It's actually a very nice procedure to get all the plaque out. You get control of the, you know, the, the renal arteries, the celiac and SMA, and you have to make a, a longitudinal arteriotomy. This is actually, this is the entire plaque with some, with some patch on it, like probably an old operation somewhere. But this is the whole plaque that just comes out. And then you just close the aorta primarily. To, typically, you don't have to do a patch on the aorta. So that's the, the lumen is pretty good. The results of open surgery are two vessel revascularization is favored because they say the recurrence in the other vessel can hurt your main vessel. Uh, the prosthetic versus vein bypass, there is no difference in graft patency, but remember if you have bowel ischemia, prost prosthetics is obviously not good to use because of infection. And usually a pain relief is excellent. The most gratifying thing about this operation is you go in on the third or the fourth day, they start eating and they say, I don't hurt anymore. That's a uh, pretty good, at least for now. And then they come back in seven months, but it's okay. Um, so results of open surgery, the long-term success is pretty good. And the, the thing is, if they survive the first few weeks to months of this operation, typically they'll do well afterwards. And that, that's, that's the thing. The, the perioperative period is obviously the tenuous one. Complications of bleeding, peri, you know, cardiac complications, uh, they are always malnourished to begin with, so wound healing and general malnutrition. Uh, is a problem, Some, they can get a prolonged ileus, lung, it's, you all know this, it's not important. Endo versus open, actually there's no level one data because there are no randomized control trials. It's hard to do that because there is a lot of selection bias based on anatomic complexity. There are so many variables in this, it's hard to make a randomized control trial on this. Um, acute, mes the little two, two minutes on acute mesenteric ischemia. It is bad, so anyone with suspected acute mesenteric ischemia, be very, very aggressive in treating them, surgically or endo, whatever you need to, because don't think that, okay, they might get better. They usually don't get better. Uh, the open treatment is used, is required to evaluate viability of the bowel, that is critical, so don't just intervene on the vessel, you have to make sure that the bowel is viable. You can have pieces of bowel that, that declare themselves, so usually it's a staged laparotomy, you take the patient to the operating room, temp close them temporarily, and take them for a second look on, the, on 24 to 48 hours. That's almost the standard. No one will ever uh, fault you for that. Uh, inside to thrombosis requires a bypass, usually anti-grade or retrograde, avoid prosthetics, like we said, and then a second look to evaluate for viability. Uh, the embolectomy is a little easier to approach in the root of the transverse uh, mesocolon, go down to the SMA. Uh, get control, and then do an embolectomy with the Fogarty catheter. Uh, the, I guess median, we don't have time for this, but this is a diagnosis by exclusion. The main thing is to make a diagnosis, rule out other diagnosis of, you know, peptic ulcer disease, infl you know, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can actually do a, the key is to do a celiac, you know, celiac plexus lysis, the neural, neural plexus around the celiac artery. And then the actual celiac artery may have post genotic dilation or, or weakening of the wall that may be replaced. Stenting or um, balloon angioplasty is not the primary treatment. You may need to intervene afterwards, but that's not the primary treatment. And then uh, pretty much people have some symptom relief. So the conclusions are take an aggressive stance on, on mesenteric ischemia. Because don't let anyone you know, fall through the crack. Uh, nutrition, if you can supplement them, it improves their overall outcome. Uh, the, you don't have to spend time getting a two-day cardiac clearance on these people, but at least consider the risk involved. You can quickly get an echo, at least get somebody to see them within hours and then decide and, and discuss the risk. Uh, technically, it's, an, it's a difficult operation, but when done well, your results are pretty good. And uh, uh, endovascular treatment avoids major morbidity, but then the benefit may not be here because uh, if you have long segment disease or, or multi-vessel disease, you might need to do something open. And thank you. We, we leave questions for Dr.